I want first to introduce Margaret Cooley, who is a cultural worker who writes nonfiction and poetry. Also with us today, <clears throat> hailing all the way from Boston, but also having nearly just stepped off the plane from Dublin, is Daniel Tobin. He's a professor of writing, literature, and publishing at Emerson College. So I want to start just by reflecting back that both of you folks have endeavored to reveal otherwise hidden histories of your family's lives. You've spent a lot of time doing this. You and I have spoke, we've both all spoken in advance of today's conversation. And it's clear to me that you have pursued the, the story of your family's histories for years, if not decades, both through genealogical work and writing and reflection. And I wonder if you can just describe to the audience how you came to the brink of doing the work that you do and where the seeds of your curiosity, um, how they were planted, and really what compelled you to respond to that curiosity and do this work. I would say that I was very much inspired since I've lived in San Francisco, California. We, we are a, a country of immigrants, and in San Francisco in particular, we have so many first-generation Americans. My husband is a, uh, just became an American citizen a couple of months ago. I have friends who are first-generation from Nicaragua, Vietnam, Palestine, Israel, Mexico, and as I watch them struggling with their cultural identities, trying to maintain their cultural identities and still have the respect uh, as um, the American citizens they are in this country, uh, it really got me to thinking about my family heritage and, and, and thinking about, wow, history really does repeat itself because I know that my people went through these same issues uh, in the famine times is when they came. And I thought to myself, why aren't more of these stories being told? We, we need to collect these stories. I, I'm at an age where my, my parents and their cousins, their siblings, they're getting close to the end of their life. And one of the main ways I collect my information for my work is through oral history. And, and so I also knew that time was of the essence, that, that there were stories that were going to be lost if I didn't start collecting these stories immediately. And, and so that's what I embarked upon doing. Uh, in my, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, my experience was uh, landing by birth into what was essentially an urban townland. My uh, family, my mother is first generation, I'm second generation, and my grandmother lived in the apartment building with us. In fact, I had aunts upstairs, we lived in the same apartment building. We had another aunt that lived fairly close by. Pretty much at least four days a week, my grandmother's brother, my uh, great uncle, would come in and uh, visit all of these people, uh, my, my, my uncle, my uh, grandmother, and so forth, all were from a little townland called Kilvendoni, outside of uh, Ballinrobe and Mayo, outside of Robine. And when I was growing up, I'd hear the names. I'd hear Robine, I'd hear Kilvendoni, and they'd conjure the sense of another world that I was uh, no longer a part of, but at the same time that I was connected to. So I think uh, why what the, I came to the brink of this sort of, uh, you know, uh, really quest gradually by hearing the names. The other experience I had when I was growing up is music in my grandmother's house. My grandmother's uh, lived on the first floor of the apartment building. The door was open. Virtually everybody who lived in that apartment building stopped by my grandmother's on the way in after work. And they'd stop in for a drink. They'd stop in to play poker. 
uh, poker, uh, not polka, uh, poker, uh, and they'd stop in sometimes to, to listen to a guy by the name of John Gibbons play his accordion on his wooden leg. He was also from Kilmandoni. So you had the sense, in my experience, of people having come over, if not quite en, en masse, then by a great number, to this other place with a kind of echo of that place being transposed into um, the world that became my world. So that was my mother's side of the family. My father's side of the family was a bit more mysterious because over time I, I heard stories of lost ants and uh, of places called St. John in Newfoundland, which was exactly not where they're from originally, uh, and uh, a sort of deeper echo further back. I also had uh, my, my grandfather's passport from 1918. Uh, you know, present, you could smell the must on it. So all of these sort of mysterious, palpable, tangible presences were there. Uh, my father's side was a bit more of a mystery, which I suppose we'll get to eventually, so I won't go into it now. And the third uh, component, uh, I think, is very, uh, you know, similar to what Margaret was just talking about. I was Irish-American. My identity was Irish-American. I didn't know what it was to be anything but Irish-American. I didn't know what a pure American was. And none of my friends were pure Americans. I, my closest friends were Arab Americans growing up from uh, Libya and, 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 uh, and Lebanon and, and Syria. Uh, I had Jewish American friends, uh, Irish American friends, African American friends. So all of our identities were mixed. So my sense of being an American immediately was to be in a mixture of things. Margaret, I wonder if you can also reflect, I, in a prior conversation with you, you talked about how um, in your home growing up, how your father had a very clear sense of wh it, where he came from, and, and it was a little bit more difficult for your mom to articulate that. Sure. Um, my mother's side of the family is 100% Irish American, and my father comes from different heritage, and he is uh, a genealogist as a hobbyist, and uh, He's got a huge internet site. I mean, he's he's really into this stuff, and and he he had actually traced his family all the way back to the Inquisition times, and then when they had moved from from Spain to a, a region of France called Alsace, and that's where his family came from as peasants in 1850, and. For generations, his family members had been going back to this place in Alsace to visit their distant cousins. They knew exactly where it was. And I was thinking, wait a second, that was only one year after my Irish American family came here. Why don't my Irish American relatives know this same information? And um, I want to try and find out what it is. And I, I didn't really know at that time what I was undertaking. I, I've heard it said that with with Irish American, it's not really genealogy; it's archaeology. And I found out about that later. You'll you'll learn. It's exciting to hear about the the so the nuts and bolts experience of of, of discovery, and and at the same time, I I know I've heard from both of you that a, a very um, sort of spiritual and very unmeasurable experience happens of, of people come alive in, your, in the histories of your family's lives. So I was wondering if you could sort of bring alive for the audience today some of the, the individuals or characters of your, of your family's history, mm -hmm. and also um, if you can both reflect on this, um, this point that Daniel's making about the importance of going to the land and seeing what is there and, and what that experience was like for you personally. Well, I thought I would read a little bit at this point. <laughs> I think this is a good point for that for me. And so you'll just hear a little bit of what my writing's been like in this experience. When I, I went to Ireland for the first time in January of 2007, and I was actually lucky enough to find um, a man in his late 80s who lived in the same area that my family had lived in, in the 1800s, who had been the, the oral historian for the area and was able to definitively know that, that my family had been there. And I was able to confirm that with actually in the records in the, in the library. 
And so I'll, I'll just read a couple of pages. It seems like the right time to introduce this. Where are we from in Ireland, Mom? She replies, my father always said the Lacys are from Tipperary. Tipperary is the name of a city and a county in Ireland, Mom. Which is it? How the hell do I know? All I know is it's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. Then she tell me, your father and I went to Ireland, but we didn't go to Tipperary. This was the extent of the family history passed on to me about my Irish American ancestry, a song about Tipperary written in England during World War I, perhaps written as a means to recruit the recalcitrant Irish into the British military. I am the first person in my family to locate and travel to the town where we came from in Ireland. It turns out that County Tipperary is only 60 miles southwest of the Dublin airport. And the place that my family lived is just 75 miles from Dublin. It is 2007 and I'm sitting in the Tipperary Studies Department of the Thurless Library in Ireland, looking for books and reading the microfilm of every county Tipperary daily newspaper from January 1st, 1847 through December 31st, 1849. I'm looking for Lacey family history, and in particular, one ancestor who disappeared between 1848 and 1849, James Lacey. From what I read in these local newspapers, it looks like the people's history of Ireland during the Great Hunger, my people's history, was never recorded in any books, nor barely mentioned in any newspapers. You will only find mention of the local people if something unusual happened, the librarian tells me, I have read the newspapers, so I know that unusual is a polite word for murdered or murderer. <laughs> Why else would a poor person's name appear in the news? Why do I think the newspapers back then report anything different from today's news? Anyway, I'm here in Ireland reading every paper just in case. I'm going to move ahead. The Lacys lived in the townlands of Cottage and Palace. In 1848, dozens of families left the townland of Cottage and the adjoining townlands of Paddock, Dogstown, and Palace, but I find no mention of evictions there in any newspaper. The Tumavara eviction of 731 reported people, the largest eviction of a single townland in one day, happened not 20 miles from Cottage and Palace in April of 1849. The Tumavara story had only one short paragraph about it in the paper. Could it, could it be that most evictions did not even make it to the newspaper unless someone died? In the news of January 19, 1848, Judith Donahue was ejected off a small farm at Couline near Burrasuli by the landlords James and John Parker she wandered about in so much want without any shelter and finally entered her former abode on the 18th of August last. For this forcible possession, she was tried and sentenced to six months confinement, which punishment she was undergoing when her death occurred. An inquest was held and the verdict was returned of died of natural causes. Eventually, I find mention of the Earl of Clonwell evicting tenants in a nearby townland. September 13, 1848, the newspaper says, on Monday last, the agent of Lord Clonmel, attended by sheriff, police, and bailiffs, evicted nine poor families, in all about 50 souls, from the townlands nearby. Nothing could be more distressing than to hear the clanking of the crowbars demolishing the cabins, mingled with the most pitiful and heart-rendering shrieks of women and children. I switch from reading the newspapers to the books. I find James Lacey in the books of the Barisley Electoral District of the Thurless Poor Law Union. The Thurless Library has most of the Electoral District rate books for the 1840s. 
These are beautiful leather pound books with copper plated writing and calligraphy style penmanship. Each name is carefully written, although the spelling of each name is not consistent from year to year. I find Lacey spelled as L-A-C-Y, L-A-C-E-Y, and L-E-A-C-Y. The rate books show the tax records of James Lacey up through 1847. There are many other tenants on the books as well. Hanley, Bourke, Ryan, McGrath, Kennedy, Lowry, Butler, and Hogan. I examined the rate books of the, that the people were paying. They paid a tax of five shillings in the pound twice a year in June and December. There is one column that shows if the tax was paid and another that indicates if the tax was in arrears. Unlike some, James Lacey was paid in full and not in arrears. The tax in December of 1846 was cut in half from the previous year, but the year 1847 shows something else. The people were taxed in May of 1847 and made to pay a four-fold increase, and then again in October of 1847, 15 times what they were paying in 1846. This amounted to a 900% increase in tax in less than one year. Still, James Lacey was paid in full and not in arrears. I show the book to the librarian, John, who knows I am reading newspapers to look for clearance notices, and he says, well, there's your answer. Now you know why they left. The newspaper mentions the establishment of an insolvent commission. This commission states, the tax afforded the clearance mongers the most effective means of getting rid of this agricultural population. Some landlords were praised as humane for forgiving three or four years rent or accepting whatever people could pay. These landlords were in the minority and the landlord of cottage where my family lived was not among them. The ratepayer book for 1848 is missing. The book for 1849 is in much worse condition than the earlier books. Unlike the other books, the rate book for 1849 is torn and muddy and has what appears to be blood stains on its pages. It is as if this book is telling me what happened that awful year. I search for James Lacey's name and find it gone, along with all the other tenants and the town lands as well. Um, I, I think uh, on that note, I'll, I'll read a, a poem from The Narrows, which is my book uh, about, uh, among other things, my quest to uh, discover the family's connection or my connection to that history. Um, and it, what happens, it seems to me, is there's the pursuit and there's the logical uh, seeking after those signs, those material signs, uh, baptismal records and so forth. And then there's, there's just pure happenstance, lucky happenstance. And what, that's what happened to me once when I went to Ireland. I stayed at a B&B. &B. You know how many B&Bs there are in Ireland, right? About a zillion. Every other house is a B&B. &B. I hit on the one B&B &B apparently in, in County Cork outside of Cove where the owner of the B&B &B said, your last name is Tobin? I know where all the Tobins came into Ireland. And I said, I'm all ears, actually. <laughs> so this poem goes into that, and the last part of the poem is actually a translation from an Irish song, The Ring. I followed the winding coast road back from Cove. Annie Moore and her brother cast in bronze at the center entrance, who were head of the line at Ellis Island, now looking as though they inquired directions in their own country. Inside the dim passage through American wake and coffin ship, the clutched figures of a prior generation reeling to swells and sound effects, each hold frozen in the ache of crossing. Further on, the surprise exhibit with my father's ship, United States, streaming into the harbor, the way it steamed into the narrows below the rising towers of the bridge. Above the keys, St. Coleman's presided over the dock where my mother's mother waited for the tender, where my father's forefather, lost in the crush, disappeared under the raw deck of the lumber boat, human ballast teeming like vermin on bodies in the fields they fled at home. 
I can tell you where the Tobins first landed, my welcoming host remarked, then invited me into the canopied patio beside the house, chinked glasses of whiskey neat and golden, the garden luminous in the long twilight. If you drive east beyond Calais and Yall, on the way to Gungarvan, off the right, off to the right, you'll come on the Ring Road, Rinnegoyle, where there are Tobins there still from Norman times. C'est Tobin, Tobin, the name Gaelicized, then Anglicized, into your own name now. I had known the history, but not the place. So next day, driving along the proffered route, each village seemed a station on a journey of return. Kinsale Beg, Grange, Kylie's Cross. I had pursued the paper trail, unwound the breed of names through census and baptism, each generation rechristening the last, until custom faltered like a language on the tongue, until the trail trailed off into the mists of the unrecorded. Now I was tracing a highway to origin, the road unreeling that was once Boreen, through townlands where the starving wandered, their potatoes scorched black with blight, as though a fire had rained over them. Grubbers of nettles, weeds, their faces swollen with fever, stench of bloody flux rising from scalps where the evicted burrowed. Men like famished dogs scoured the fields, an official wrote. I saw in one cottage a royal of rats feasting on an infant. Nowhere have I witnessed anything like it, not in Calcutta, not in Dahomey, the voiceless children silenced by hunger, whole towns turned to habitations of ash pits, the bodies burned at night, leaving no trace. Descending the drum hills beyond Gortin, I turned off the main road following signs in a language I had lost before I was born. This was Goraltucht, remnant of the Dees, land before the land was renamed and hushed. What was left for me, generations gone? A perfume of turf smoke fresh in my nostrils, pastures green reached to the head of the bay, thick fuchsia hedges, roads that were cow paths where locals greeted with slowly raised hands, or a nod of the cap to my stranger's car, the postcard my eye had framed in its longing. Then Mooney's pub, where I stopped for a pint and let slip my quest. So you're a Tobin, Anya said, accommodating my English. They're all about here. Have you heard of Niklaus, the great singer? She showed the photograph with its dark hair and features, unlike my own, though a vague resemblance to a dead uncle, but I couldn't say for sure. What was the ring but another station happened on my chance or seeming grace? So why not trace further through lost Norman crests or track DNA to nomadic tribes 6,000 years gone from the banks of the Ganges or further back through each human cell to African Eve, her grunts are shibboleth tuning savannas. I felt the gift, shared thrumming in the bones later that night in the crowded room when all the instruments had gone silent and a man rose up shyly, regally alone, and sang Sean Noss, one of the singer's songs. It's a beautiful country I take you to by the back black water streams of the Dees where the thrush and the blackbird sing sweetly and the wild deer range over the mountains, where branches bend low with fruits and blossoms and all the hives brim over with honey, where the cuckoo croons the whole summer long and the corn creek lifts its cries in the grass. Your poem evokes so much a sense of place and you mentioned earlier the sensation of going to Canada and what it felt like to be sort of in that place in Canada, but again, in, in other opportunities to be in that land in Ireland. And I, I wonder if you can just reflect for the audience and Margaret yourself as well, like what was some of the physical experiences you were having in, and, and what was the importance of actually going to the place by way of um, informing your story? It reminds, I don't know if anybody has seen recently, the, uh, there's a wonderful series on right now uh, on uh, called I African American Lives. Yeah. And um, it's, it reminds me so much of my experience and, and you know, some of the things that were said that ring true for me are, are things like um, 
if we don't know where we come from, we don't know that we're somebody. It's like, you know, it's the effects of colonization, you know, when, when, the, when our story is taken from us, uh, in our in, in our, when our language is taken and, a, and uh, we're disoriented and we come to a new country, we're not literate, it, it, it's a way to keep people oppressed. And so uh, it, the part of reclaiming ourselves as Irish Americans and having the biggest life possible means knowing everything, everything there is to know about ourselves and our people. Um, I'll just talk briefly about the uh, going to St. John, New Brunswick once I found out. I actually had set that trip up and then 9-11 happened. And uh, so I ended up going on this journey back to where my family first came over about a week after 9-11 which was a kind of remarkable experience in itself because the airports were totally empty. Everybody was gone. Until we got to Canada where there was this incredible crush of people moving through the styles with added security and so forth. So when I actually got into St. John, New Brunswick, I went to the, the St. John Parish Registry. I met the woman I spoke with on the phone, Mary Kilfoyle McDivitt, and she just gave me complete access to the archives. Uh, which gave me all of the information, ships lists and so forth, when they likely came over, 1850, 1851, thereabouts. I could not, there was no marriage record for them. There was no marriage record for them in Ireland either, which means that they probably got married on the boat, which happened often at that time. That's where I found out that um, the trade between um, uh, New Brunswick, the Maritimes, and County Cork was a lumber trade. They brought lumber over, and human beings came back as ballast for the boat, and that was the trade. Um, so, profound history that you know my ancestors were a part of, and not just mine, but so many thousands and millions of people have this story deep, deep, deep in their background. I also found out the location of where my um, great great grandfather was buried in St. Mary's Cemetery in St. John, New Brunswick, which is completely ruined by acid rain because they built a refinery up over it. This is an Irish American graveyard. Uh, it's one of the real <laughs> memorials to uh, the experience of, of coming over here in famine times. Also Partridge Island, which was the transitional center that they had to go through. Not as well known as Gross Isle in Canada. Um, I stood about where the plot was which was essentially a mass grave. There was no marker at all. They were buried together with the other poor in this one little area. So to be standing there um, in the space where your great-great-grandfather was and other members of your family, to have no marker, and to just, they're, they're the grass, you know? Like Whitman says, you look for me under your boot soles, you know? Uh, they're the grass underneath your feet. Uh, or their bodies are anyway. And that is a humbling experience. We're all part of a remnant. And if we think we're not, then we're deluding ourselves. And it seems to me that genealogical uh, quests and, and searches should humble you ultimately before that because there's only traces left, there's only signs left. And those signs are, are not empty, you know? They transubstantiate, so to speak, the, the lives that were, that, are, that were there, that were gone, and yet are somehow encoded in us. Thank you.